Hi, Randy Kay here. We all go through struggles at times, and I want to share with you through stories and insights and interviews with others how much God loves you. He loves you immensely, and that's what I hope you will hear through our interviews and what we have to share with you. Thanks for staying tuned. Here we go. Welcome to this episode of Revelations from Heaven. My guest today, Carl Falcon. Well, he has a very unique experience in heaven after dying. And that is, not only did he see through the eyes of Jesus Christ, as Paul talked about in the Bible, with the Christ mindset, but he also came away with a gift of healing, a special gift of healing imparted to him in heaven. At the end of this program, he's going to be praying for you and I have no doubt there will be many that will be healed through this program. First, Carl, I want to uh, say thank you to you for joining us today. Thank you, Randy. It's a privilege and a pleasure to be here. Well, this is going to be a fascinating account, Carl. So um, you and I have shared um, an experience in, in the afterlife. Uh, but your experience is one that is unique in a few ways. We'll find that those aspects of, of your story in heaven. But uh, I was absolutely fascinated by it. So uh, let's start then in your, your spiritual journey, actually. You became a Christian and uh, you developed your kind of theology over the years before uh, you had a face-to-face -face encounter. So why don't we begin there? Yeah, Randy, I want to go back to 1978, and that's when I heard the gospel plainly preached on a program called Show My People. It was Bob Jones University, and Bob Jones uh, was the host there. And he put me in contact with a local pastor, Charles B. Gross, and Pastor Gross came to my home, and he presented me with the gospel and asked me to uh, choose Christ as my savior. And so I did that. And that was 1978. I was a senior in high school and I went uh, from there to college. And while I was at college, I became involved in several Christian organizations. And one of them invited me out to a retreat in, in the woods of Pennsylvania. And there uh, Darlene Sizemore uh, asked me, to give my heart to Christ, to make him my Lord. So first Savior, then Lord. And I did that. And then she gave me a prophetic word. And I memorized it because that was the first one I'd ever received. And she said that the Lord, the Spirit of God told her, Carl, my son, I know that you've done well to choose to walk the path I've chosen for you. Go and tell others what I've done in your heart. My blessings rest upon you. And I'm here today because of that word, especially the part, go and tell others what I've done in your heart. So I'm here today in obedience to that, to tell you what the Lord did in my heart. And after that, I really applied myself to understand the Christian faith and apply it in my life. And I read a lot of very good Christian literature. Among the books I read that in my freshman year of college was the book, Caught Up Into Paradise by Dr. Richard Eby. It was a fascinating book about his near-death experience. And in his experience, he was in the presence of God and the Lord gave him the opportunity to ask any question that he wanted. I found it fascinating, but afterwards I realized uh, those questions really could have been answered without having to go to deity. Uh, most of the questions he asked were plainly answered in the scriptures. And uh, other things are in the church fathers and church history and the writings of various uh, Christian authors. So I thought that was a missed opportunity. And I determined that if I ever had such an opportunity, I would be better prepared. So I made a list of all the questions which I had difficulty with, questions which my pastor didn't answer, I couldn't find in the scriptures. Uh, when I had opportunities to speak to um, the greater Christian teachers, theologians, and so forth, uh, they did not give me a satisfactory answer. They always gave me an answer. I just didn't uh, didn't think that really addressed the question. 
And over the years, I revised that list because I answered some of them myself. I had some answered by other people. Um, but by about 1995, I had about a dozen uh, questions on my list that still remain unanswered. And that's when I had my near-death experience. <clears throat> to give you a little background on that situation, I'm an engineer and I had worked on contract uh, that winter and I was uh, laid off after the contract was completed, but I didn't find employment right away and we were in a kind of difficult situation. I had no income, we'd gone through my savings and right about the coldest part of the winter. Now it's in Texas, so we're not talking about, you know, Wisconsin winter here, but it was cold. The furnace in our home failed and the way it failed was the pilot light would go out and it was an older model and when the um, pilot light would go out it would continue to put gas to the burners and of course as it got colder it would put more and more gas out and that was a little dangerous uh, as an engineer and a concern with safety i developed i couldn't do much because i had no money for spare parts couldn't hire a technician to come out there so i did my best with what i could and when the pilot light would go out I would uh, turn off the gas, I would turn on the exhaust fan, make sure all the fumes were out of the house, relight the pilot light, um, turn on the gas again, make sure the burners were operating correctly, and then close up the furnace and carry on. Well, it happened one night uh, that that furnace had stopped going multiple times, I lost count, and very late at night, um, it did it again, and I was sleepy, I was probably, um, groggy from the gas fumes. And uh, when I got up to uh, turn off the gas or to, to deal with the problem of the furnace, I didn't bother turning on the lights because I knew my house well. I felt my way to the furnace. And the thought occurred to me to just toss a match in and uh, ignite the burners that way. Now, my part of my mind said, that's not a good idea. Don't do it, it's very unsafe. But part of me remembered all the time since, since childhood I'd played with fire and gotten away with little or minor injuries and consequences. So I thought, well, this time will be like those and there won't be any serious issues. I'll get the burners going and go back to bed. Well, I took a box of Strike Anywhere matches and I lit that match and I threw it straight into the burner section of the furnace. And I didn't even see that match land. There was a white flash and a woof sound. It felt like a hot mattress just smacked me and knocked me back across the hallway and into the wall on the opposite side from the furnace. And then it was dark again. And I found myself sitting on the floor of my hallway. I didn't feel any pain, so I assumed that I'd gotten off lightly. And I decided to go to the bathroom to see what the damage was. And I expected to see, you know, singed eyebrows and maybe a few other things. Well, I got into the bathroom and I turned on the light and two things hit me at that moment. The first was pain, very serious pain, pain like I'd never felt before. And the second was I saw myself in the mirror and I realized this is bad. My face was all red. Uh, my eyebrows were completely gone. The hair around my head was singed off. I didn't have a beard at the time, so if I had a beard, it would have been probably mostly gone too. And my right hand was charred. I mean, it was third degree burns along here. Uh, it was second degree burns up to the elbow. And um, I tried to run the water over it and it just thing was awful. Mm. Well, that started a few days of real suffering. I had no money again, no insurance for medical treatment. And I tried to treat myself with whatever I had at hand, uh, basically some burn cream and some antihistamines and some ice water and I discovered that at night the pain was so serious that I could not sleep. I thrashed about in bed so to give the mother of my children some relief I moved to the living room and slept, tried to sleep on the couch but I'm a tall man. I'm about six foot four and that couch was short so I really couldn't lie full length on it but it would sit uh, kind of propped up with the arm in my back my legs out on the uh, cushions of the couch. That actually prolonged my life. Uh, you're a pulmonologist, so you should know that when people get burned, not only on the outside, but I was burned in my nose and throat, uh, that they can develop pneumonia. 
and I was burned. I, my throat was so sore, <clears throat> I could not eat, couldn't drink, and even swallowing my own saliva was horribly painful. Uh, rust had been blasted into my eyes, and so they were infected. Uh, so that was in addition to the painful burns. <coughs> and, excuse me. So I'm on the couch, I'm holding my hand in the ice water, and by the third night, I had not gotten much sleep, and I was desperate for some rest. I thought, if I can get some rest, maybe that'll help with the healing process, because it wasn't making much progress there. So I decided to pull the couch cushions off the couch, lay them on the floor so I could at least lie full length. And uh, once I did that, I turned off the lights and lay down on the floor. It was almost exactly midnight when that happened. And then I remembered, oh, I left my ice water up by the couch. So I tried to get up and get the ice water, but I found I couldn't move. And more importantly, I couldn't breathe. And I realized I was in a serious predicament because it's midnight. I'm the only one awake. Everybody's asleep in their bedrooms. And if I suffocate and die, uh, there'll be no one there to help me until the morning. And so I really tried to get up. I tried to breathe. I didn't realize that the water had moved up from the bottom of my lungs from my sitting position. And when I lay down, it, it flowed up into the upper parts of my chest. I could not get any air in at all. And so as I lay there, I realized there's only one option left to me here. I couldn't speak, so I couldn't call for help. And all I had to do left was pray. And by that time, you know, I'd been a, a Bible class teacher in church. Uh, I knew how to pray. I'd read lots of books on prayer. And so my first prayer was very eloquent, very, very um, heartfelt, and nothing happened. And in fact, I've been studying a book on prayer and healing uh, for the last few days, trying to get relief from my pain. And But I was also finding my mind was starting to shut down from lack of oxygen. And as my mind shut down, I could pray less and less, a paragraph, a sentence, a phrase. And finally, it got to the point where the only thing I could pray was word. And I was on the last word, and I realized I had to make this count. So my last prayer was one word, and it was help. Mm -hmm. It was directed towards God, and it was help on any terms he offered me. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I prayed that prayer, all the pain disappeared, and even more remarkably, the room became lighted. It was, it was just totally lighted. And I stood up, and I felt great. The pain was gone. Not only was the pain gone, but I felt more vital than I had ever felt in my entire life. Um, and the first thing I noticed was my vision had changed. I normally wear uh, corrective lenses, and that's for both an astigmatism and nearsightedness. But I could see perfectly. I looked at the windows, and I could see the individual wires and the screens on the windows. And I looked closer, and I could see the flakes of corrosion on those wires. That's like microscopic. And then I looked across the street, and even in darkness, I could see the individual blades in the grass of my neighbor's lawn. And between the grass were the uh, particles of dirt, and grains of sand. I thought, wow, I'm not only healed. This is supernatural healing. I am better than ever before. And my hearing was amazing. Uh, as I was looking across the street, I realized I could hear traffic, but it was trucks moving. And it was five blocks to the nearest road where trucks were allowed. I thought, I hear trucks like they're next door and they're at least five blocks away. I thought, that's really amazing, my hear. And, you know, I, I, one of my hobbies is firearms and I've suffered a little hearing loss from that, but this was more than I'd ever had before. And then the third thing was my sense of smell was incredible. It was so amazing that I could distinguish the scents of the paint on the walls. And I could smell the smell of the uh, paper in the books and other things that were very subtle. And what was remarkable to me was I'd never noticed these smells before, but I instantly recognized what they were. 
So, Carl, um, at this point where you had these enhanced senses, were you seeing your body or what was the what was the relationship to your body as as you had succumbed to to your illness? So initially, I was just fascinated with my senses and the fact I wasn't with pain. So I didn't even think about looking for my body. I thought I was alive. And then I looked down on the floor and there I saw my own body lying there on the floor and still on the cushions. And that's when I realized, no, I wasn't healed. I was dead. And um, I thought, well, this isn't so bad. I mean, I still have, I'm me. I had all my memories, I had my emotions, I had my personality, and I felt great. Um, and at that point, I decided to try out this new experience of being in the spirit. And I realized I needed to do, get some help for my uh, situation. So I, the nearest bedroom was my daughter's bedroom. And so I went to her door um, to open it and try to go in there and wake her and, and tell her what was going on. Uh, but my hand went right through the door handle, and I thought, oh, that's an obstacle. Mm -hmm. But I'm an engineer, and I think in terms of solving problems, and I thought, well, if my hand goes through the handle, I can go through the door. And I did that. I stepped right through the door. And it was an interesting sensation. I, as I stepped through the door, it felt like I was passing through a curtain of falling sand. It was cool, and uh, my sight was temporarily... Uh, locked uh, by as I was inside the door, couldn't see anything inside the door. And then when I emerged from the other side of the door, her room was also lighted. And, and I should have mentioned that this was uh, unusual lighting because the lights were off. Um, but even though the light room was perfectly lighted, there were no shadows. So I could see perfectly in the dark and the colors were normal and natural. It wasn't like IR or anything like that. Um, in fact, the colors were a little different, maybe more pastel than uh, the standard colors I see with my natural eyes, but it was still, everything was recognizable. And I went over to my daughter and I tried to wake her. Um, first, I tried to touch her shoulder, but my hand went through her shoulder and she didn't respond. I tried to speak to her, but uh, she, she apparently couldn't hear me. Um, so I didn't get any response from her. I thought, oh, I'll try my son. So the two bedrooms are side by side and the quickest way to go from one bedroom to the other is to walk through the closet and i thought i'll just walk through the closet and so um i entered her closet passed through the wall and exited his closet went right through his clothes and everything without any hindrance and i wasn't thinking at the time but i i think it's remarkable that i could go through the walls but i didn't sink into the floor so if i ever had such an experience again i would like to try uh, both diving into the ground and flying in the air, but you know, that didn't occur to me at the time. Mm. But anyway, I went to my son's bed in the same situation. I tried to wake him up with a touch and I tried to speak to him and he didn't respond. And by that time I realized, you know, when, when someone's dead, they've got about five or six minutes before brain death sets in. And I realized that clock was ticking. And so I went straight back to the living room uh, to see what I could do about raising my body. Um, again, I'm a problem solver. I had read accounts of people coming back from the dead. I, I read about resurrecting. So I was going to look at my body and see what I could do. And I knelt down by my body in the living room. And that was when I had a very unique and unusual sensation. Um, the only thing I can compare it to is if you're watching a horror movie and suddenly the tempo of the music changes and you know that something really bad is about to happen to one of the characters. So if I had had flesh and hair, I would have I'd, I'd been covered with goosebumps and my hair would have been going up. Uh, I felt evil, just intense, potent, powerful evil was approaching me. And just reflexively, I stood up to face whatever it was that was approaching. And these two creatures stepped right through the wall of my living room. I call them creatures because they were man-sized and man-shaped, but they were clearly not people. Um, they were covered in uh, short black fur. Uh, they had on their fingers and toes, instead of fingernails, they had dark black curved talons and their ears were pointed. Um, 
their eyes were just yellow. There was no pupil in them. When they opened their mouths, I could see bright red tongue and white fangs, upper and lower fangs. And they, um, they looked like rather they were, they looked like they were both emaciated and very tough muscularly. So they were like a person who was um, used to hard physical labor, uh, but was a bit underfed. And um, they were carrying manacles. And they appeared to be made out of some gray metal. And as they came into the room, I tried to speak to them. And I asked, who are you? Why are you here? What are you doing? And uh, they responded. And this was not speech. Um, this was mind to mind, because they didn't reply in mere words. Uh, they replied in uh, words, in motions, in visual images, in feelings and sensations. So I would call it telepathy because it was far more broader spectrum of information than just speech. <clears throat> what were you uh, feeling at this time, Carl? Was there fear? Obviously, these figures do not, they sound pretty intimidating and, and not altogether friendly looking. What was yes, your sense? I was very apprehensive and very anxious. Um, fear would be an ina inadequate term uh, for it, terrified perhaps. Um, but I, somehow I had the presence of mind to stand my ground rather than flee. Um, I don't know where that came from, but it was just in me to do that. <clears throat> and these things responded to me. First, they laughed, or no, no sorry, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. No, the first thing they showed told me was that they had always been with me my entire life, and their purpose was to kill me. Um, because they regarded me as food and fuel for their purposes, not as a person. They, they didn't regard me as a, a, a human being with a personality, they just regarded me as a resource to be exploited. And they told, they explained to me they were going to take me to hell, and they gave me images of hell. And it was absolutely horrific. It was a place of utter chaos, of um, pain, suffering. And they were enjoying showing me these things too. I could tell there was a certain pleasure they took out of um, frightening me with these things. Uh, for example, there's uh, terrible hunger, but there's nothing to eat. There's thirst and there's nothing to drink. You're desperately tired, uh, but there's no way to get any rest. And they devour you, they consume you through torment. And it's the most horrific tortures that you could imagine. Um, and they, there was no limit to what they would do to you. So that was the horrible picture. And my response was, I assumed they were demons. They didn't explain what they were or who they were. But at that point, I realized I was probably facing demons who were trying to take me to hell. And I responded, I'm a Christian. I was baptized. I confessed Christ as my savior. I'm born again. I've been in church. I've done good works. Uh, I read the Bible. I pray every day. And I went on my little list here and they interrupted me and they laughed. They thought that was hilarious. And they, then they uh, communicated to me a list of the sins that I had never properly dealt with in my life. The church that I attended had always told me that if you confess Christ as your savior, you're saved. And that they, they also taught me, you know, if you just say, you know, confess a sin and you're sorry, you know, I'll forgive you. Well, the church never really taught me what were sins. I just assumed they were the, you know, the Ten Commandments and, you know, the, the seven deadly sins and major things like that. But the list that they showed me was very extensive and it went all the way from little things such as being cross with a cashier in a store because she's going a little slow. That's sufficient to put a person in hell because that's not loving. And what I learned later too was that since God made us literally out of himself, anything we do to a person, even what we think about them, he takes personally like they were done to him, both good and evil. And so, um, yeah, if you treat someone badly, that's like treating God badly because that's his child, that's him. Uh, this was a concept I'd never understood before. Um, I cheated once in high school on one exam. Uh, that was bad. And I'd broken some promises. That was really bad. God was very concerned about keeping promises. And there were a number of other things. I had 
have been excused by, I had uh, agreed to um, a rental agreement with a, a former college roommate. And when I got married, I couldn't afford to pay rent on both places. So I told him, you know, I need out of this lease so I can afford my new place with my wife. And uh, he said, yes, that's no problem. And he got another roommate right away who picked up the slack. But you know what? I had made an agreement to pay that rent to the end of the lease term. And I did wrong when I broke that promise. And I thought, but my roommate agreed to it. And he got a new roommate to pay for it. He never suffered any loss. But that was a problem. And so on. Um, and they laughed at me and they thought that was funny. And I knew they had me. Uh, and they were, I could tell they were immensely much stronger than me. I had, would, I would have had the chance of a, a kitten against a Rottweiler against those creatures. And they were coming towards me to put the manacles on me. And I didn't want to go to hell. It was terrible. And they, I, I, I was thinking to myself, there must be some way out of this. And in that state, I had total recall of everything I'd ever experienced in this life from birth to that moment. And so I reviewed everything in my mind and to review my entire life history took seconds, just, just a few seconds. And it was so detailed. If I had looked at someone's face, I could have promptly told you how many eyelashes they had or other details like that. So I reviewed my whole life looking for something that would give me um, a way out of the situation. And at that point, I remembered when I had been going to a house church, Plainsboro Gospel Fellowship in New Jersey. And there was a person there, and I wish today I wish to remember his name, because he made the difference for me for my eternal destiny by some things he said. He was, he was what I would call a Jesus person. Um, he was always talking about Jesus and angels and the Holy Spirit and demons. And he would give me books to read. Uh, John G. Lake was one of the main authors that he liked to share. And <clears throat> I frankly didn't relate to what he was telling me, and the books were way out of my side of my experience. But I appreciated his uh, interest in me and his zeal, so I listened to him and I read the books. And one thing he told me made all the difference. He said, Carl, if you ever meet a demon, rebuke it in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, at that point, I was ready to try anything because uh, the consequences were very grave. And so I said to the demons, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ. And it was like a wrecking ball hit them. They were just flung right out of the room and they were gone. Wow. And I was very relieved. But I also realized I'm a disembodied spirit. And even if the demons don't come back for me, Judgment Day is not going to be good. So I looked at my body and said, I have to fix this. And I got down by that body and I was feeling around, trying to examine the situation, trying to understand what I was dealing with, looking for a way to, to revive this body. And that's when I had the second a very unique feeling. So, the first uh, sensation I had was of pure evil, and the next one was pure love, pure good. It was beautiful. It was wonderful. It was an amazing feeling of just love and acceptance and purity and holiness and beauty. And I stood up from my body, and I felt something was coming through the front door. And when I looked, there came Jesus Christ himself. He looked exactly as I would expect him to. Uh, he was a Caucasian man of about average height with uh, sort of wavy brown hair, a short brown beard. He had brown eyes. Um, he was dressed in a white tunic and he had a blue robe folded over his shoulder. I think he had a sash. He was wearing sandals on his feet and he wasn't carrying anything in his hands. I wish I had paid more closer to attention to the hands to see where the wounds were, whether they were in the palms or the wrist, but I missed that one. Sorry. <laughs> and because that's a little controversy, I, one of the questions I'm always trying to solve. Um, but anyway, as he came through the door, he, the first thing well, I can, me, If I can interject there, Carl, because I've interviewed uh, quite a few who have seen him, including yours truly, 
that um, that the common understanding, including my testimony, is, is, mm -hmm. is along the wrist. That's what the medical science says, and that's what I would expect. <clears throat> so I'm sorry. No, no, I That's appreciate a common that. question that people I, ask, and obviously you're the engineer and, and uh, you're very detail oriented. But uh, so you're at, at this point, and Jesus had entered the room. You had declared the name of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. which brought you into this space where you now were in the midst of, of Jesus. I was in the presence of the Messiah, uh, my Savior. And it was wonderful and it was terrible at the same time. Um, because I could feel his incredible power and authority. I, uh, but the first thing he said to me, and again, this is not speech, this is mind to mind, so I'm gonna call it telepathy. <clears throat> but he um, explained to me that this is not his real appearance. He was just appearing to me in that form because uh, it was so I would recognize him. And frankly, that was not necessary. Uh, just being in his presence, in the spirit, I knew who I was in the presence of. There was no question about that. Uh, something about being in the spirit when you're in a spirit and you meet another spirit, you know all about them immediately. Uh, so anyway, uh, the next thing he told me was that he knew all about me. He knew my every sin, but he still loved me unconditionally. And I really needed to hear that. Uh, after what the demons had shown me, I was afraid of God's wrath big time. And he put that fear to rest <clears throat> with his love, just like it says in the scriptures. And then he told me he was very disappointed in me and that uh, even though I had given my life to him, I had done nothing in this life uh, that mattered uh, as far as his criteria would go. And even though I'd been, I hardly missed a church service, I read my Bible every day, I prayed, I'd done good works. The issue was my motives were not right. Uh, I did it out of duty. He wanted it out of love. And that's where I really went wrong. And we moved on from that. <clears throat> and he said that because I had invoked his name, that he is faithful to keep his word. And the word is that all who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. And at that point, I could go to heaven. But I would go, as it says in the scriptures, like one saved from fire, without having accomplished anything of any merit in my life. I would be among the lowest of the saints in heaven, but I would be in heaven and not hell. That was reassuring, but I also disappointed me because I had tried uh, very hard to be a good Christian, at least by the criteria the church gave me. And so that really kind of crushed me. Um, but then he said to me, there is another option for you. He said, if you don't come back, your children will not be raised right and they will go to hell. And so he gave me the option of uh, being healed and resurrected and raising my children. Uh, but he warned me that if I came back, I couldn't do what I had just done and you know pull that little trick again. That wouldn't work. I had to get it right this time or I would go to hell. And that was really a frightening idea. So I love my children. Um, I wouldn't want my worst enemy to go to hell, let alone my own children. And so I knew for their sakes, I had to come back. And I could also tell that that's what Christ wanted too. So I agreed I would come back. Um, if my heart had been beating my chest, it would have been pounding because I had just glimpsed hell. And I had, um, even though I had tried my best to get it right, I had failed. And I wasn't very confident that I would get it right. Uh, next time, even with the knowledge I just gained. Um, and so when I agreed to come back, Jesus said that when the Father created my spirit, before I was even born, he had put in me the gift of healing, and he would show me how to heal my body. And as soon as he said that, the whole scene shifted, and I was no longer in the living room, but I found myself on the bank of a very broad, uh, muddy river. And on the banks of the river were growing papyrus reeds. And there were people there. There was a woman working in the field. And there was a man uh, fishing with a net off the bank of the river. Uh, they were short, dark people with uh, dark skin and straight black hair. And they were wearing 
clothing typical of the illustrations we see of ancient Egyptians. And given the papyrus reeds and the people in ancient clothing, I presumed that the scene was uh, ancient Egypt. And Christ indicated the uh, there was a pile of cut and dried papyrus reeds, some tools, a long pole, and some rope were lying on the bank there. And he uh, indicated he wanted me to build a boat. And he gave me an image that looked like a high, proud, flat bottom canoe. And uh, <clears throat> so I uh, set to work, and very quickly I built the boat. And let me interject here uh, something I didn't understand at the time, but I uh, understood much later that the reason for being in Egypt, whether I was physically there in the time and place or it was just a vision, was that uh, my mentality, my understanding uh, was in the world. Egypt represents uh, the world system, you know, the traditional uh, medicine, medical treatments and so forth. And so we had to start in the world, but we were going into the river, which represented um, spiritual things. <clears throat> so he was taking me from the world into the spirit is what he was doing metaphorically through that vision. Anyway, we got into the boat. He stepped in first. I grabbed the pole and climbed in the canoe and shoved it off the bank into the river and we sailed down the river. And not very far down the river, there was a little lime island. Um, it just had a few shrubs and small trees on it. It was pretty flat. But what was remarkable about the island is that superimposed on the island was an image of my body. Uh, if you've ever seen the Invisible Man models, this was the image there where the uh, skin and organs were transparent and the organs that were damaged uh, had different colorations so that they were not transparent but opaque. So you could see which was damaged and which was still healthy. For example, my eyes were like black sooty balls. Uh, my burnt throat was a red tube. My lungs were lung shaped and they were a kind of a gray mottled, gray greenish mottledy color. Uh, my arm uh, where it had been burned, it was uh, red and black and the uh, most severe burns were white. And uh, as we approached the island, Christ told me to stand up in the boat and reach out. So I, if I could just pause a little bit, Carl. So there seems to have been a juxtaposition of what your physical body had succumbed mm -hmm. to, the, Ill, the sickness to your spirit body. Is, would that be a fair assessment of what you were seeing? Um, I think this image represented simply my physical body because mm -hmm. my soul and my spirit, <clears throat> they were me in the boat. Yeah. So these were two separate things. I don't, I don't think I was looking at anything on the island that indicated it was connected with my spirit. Okay. So that what you were seeing just was entirely spirit at this point, and you were in the <clears> boat, <throat> and there was a symbolic nature to Egypt and, and the water, which represented more the, what, you, what the river of life, something to that effect? Um, I don't know. Uh, I can only say that the, um, superimposed, the superimposition of my body on the island was kind of a, <clears throat> a transition from the natural to the spiritual, was showing them juxtaposed on each other. But again, it was just my physical body that was represented there, not anything to do with the spirit. Anyway, we, as I touched the eyes, they became, or sorry, I didn't touch the eyes. I touched the throat, it became clear. I touched the lungs, they became clear. I touched the arm and the hand and they became clear. And uh, we sailed down towards the feet of the body on the island. And I was just turning the boat around at the base of the island to go back up and finish the job by touching the eyes that we had passed initially. And suddenly I was back in my living room again. And I was standing next to the body with Christ at, um, I think he was on my left hand side, <clears throat> which makes sense because um, you want to be on the right hand side of someone when you want to honor them. Uh, but then right through the walls where they came before the de demons came again with their uh, manacles and they were straight, heading straight for me very quickly. And they 
I could tell that they wanted to arrest me. And I initially, um, I presumed that because Christ was right by me, he would naturally protect me. But he didn't make a move and he didn't say a word. And the demons were almost on me when I realized um, it's up to me to deal with these demons like I did before. Uh, there is a whole lesson right in that one little scene there. It's that um, God gives us authority and power to deal with demons. That's Luke 10, 19, and, Mark, and it's Matthew 18, 18 through 20, uh, to bind and crush demons. <clears throat> uh, and God will not do for us what he's given for us to do. I didn't realize all that then. That I didn't have time to make that kind of a mental gymnastics. I just realized I needed to rebuke these demons. And I said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ. And it was like a wrecking ball hit them again, and they were gone. And as soon as that happened, we were back in the vision of Egypt. And I was pulling the boat back up towards the head of the island where my eyes were. I reached out, touched the eyes. They became clear. And as soon as that was done, we were back in the room. <clears throat> and at that point, Jesus told me it was time for me to go back in my body. Uh, he would resurrect me. And it was then that I remembered my list of questions. And, oh, I wanted to ask those questions so bad. But unlike um, Dr. Eby's uh, experience, uh, God did not offer me the uh, opportunity to ask all those questions. And I was trying to frame in my mind, how can I ask Christ to answer my questions? You know, when you're sitting in your living room and thinking about these things, you know, I say, oh, I'll corner God and ask him, demand these questions be answered. When you're in the presence of deity, um, you don't think like that at all. It's like, the first I try to think, you know, <clears throat> what does he owe me? What are promises can I grab, grab onto? But he had just saved me from hell. He had <laughs> healed my body. He showed me how to heal my own body. And he was about to resurrect me and give me another chance at life. Uh, and I owed him nothing. I owed him everything. I couldn't think of any um, basis in which to make a request of any kind, let alone ask for the questions. And I was kind of resigned to, well, I gotta go back and with all these questions unanswered and, and missed opportunity. <clears throat> but you know what? Uh, I didn't realize something. I realized that. Christ knew my thoughts. He could read my mind. He knew everything going on in my head. And then he said to me, Carl, how would you like the answers to my list of questions? Oh, that surprised me. He got my attention. But I had no clue what his list of questions might be. I thought, oh, is there another question, set of questions besides mine? Um, and I thought about it for a moment, and I realized, well, whatever list of questions he has, it has to be better than mine. And desperately as I wanted my list of questions answered, I mm -hmm. said, yes, I want your list of questions. And then he said to me, Carl, my list of questions is all questions. And your mind is too small to comprehend that list. So to understand my list of questions, you have to become one with me and share my mind. Are you willing to do that? Well, first I was a bit apprehensive because I read a lot of NDEs. I'd never heard of anybody becoming one with God in their NDE. And <clears throat> I didn't know what the ramifications of that were. I know that in some religions, they teach that um, to become one with God is to lose your personality, to basically um, cease to exist and just become one with the universe or one with God. And that was kind of a scary thought, but I thought, well, I really could tell that he loved me. I knew that he wanted what's best for me. So whatever he had in mind, it's got to be good. He's a good God, and I trust him. So I said to the Lord, I agree. And the next moment I remember was I felt myself drawn into him. Like, I don't know how to describe it. It's like being sucked through into a vacuum cleaner. But it was a nice, pleasant feeling. <clears throat> And uh, the scene in the living room completely disappeared. And I became one with not just Jesus, but God the Father was also one at the same time, uh, which was interesting because Holy Spirit wasn't part of that group. Uh, later on, I realized that Holy Spirit 
has been sent to earth. He's here, not in heaven. That's a whole other lesson. And that's why he wasn't part of the uh, Trinity at the moment. So <clears throat> uh, I got a glimpse of everything God was doing. Everything was aware. I was aware of the entire mind of God. It was amazing. It was so vast and dynamic. It was, you couldn't, the words fail me to describe it, but I saw the whole universe. I saw the many different worlds, the many different peoples on different worlds. Um, I saw the celestial city. It was vast uh, metropolis of real buildings with millions of people in it. There was a throne room, a a amazing throne room, just like described in the Bible. And I realized, wow, the whole Bible is true. And everything the prophets have um, described there is, is, is real and it's happening. And it's even beyond, way, way, way beyond what uh, is revealed in the scriptures. There's so much more to it than that. And then kind of a wall formed around my mind in God and cut all that off. And we focused on one particular subject. And that is uh, the history of mankind on earth. And we, <clears throat> uh, something to explain about the mind of God is that it's capable of handling many subjects simultaneously. So there were multiple things going on all at the same time. And in that state, it was perfectly natural and easy as anything uh, to comprehend um, more than one thing at a time. So when I describe things, it's not happening in succession, it's happening simultaneously. And um, these are things of very vast scope and complexity, and they're perfectly understandable. Um, there's absolutely no, <clears throat> There's no possibility of God ever uh, misunderstanding and failing to comprehend anything. He can't, no, no amount of information is too trivial for him or too vast. I loved it as an engineer. I just absolutely loved it. So um, Jesus then explained to me that we were going to look at all questions in a particular way. We're going to look at the decisions that people made and the consequences that they have on their lives. And we began with looking at one person and the decisions that they made and the consequences that they followed. And we would we'd be able to see what are the options. You know, everybody has multiple options. And an interesting thing I saw right away <clears throat> was that uh, while we have an infinite number of options in the course of our life, they are clearly bounded. Uh, God will not permit us ever to go beyond what he can deal with. So again, we, while we have many options, there are clearly limits and bounds on everything. So we looked at um, the person's life and the decisions they made. And one thing that was going on at the same time is I saw a timeline of human history where each person's life was represented by a thread. And this thread would begin when they were born and they would uh, sort of end when they died, but they would, after they died, they would go on to one, two places, either heaven or hell. And the threads would change colors depending on what was going on in their lives. If they were living righteously, they would be white. If they were sinning, they would turn various shades darker uh, from tan to brown to black, depending on the severity of their sins. And then when they died, it would change to one of two colors, gold if they went to heaven, and then red if they went to hell. And right away, I noticed something very significant about this <clears throat> timeline. Actually, several things. Uh, the first was that the threads would coalesce into bundles. They would kind of twine together. A uh, family would be the smallest bundle. A community would be the next largest bundle. And then as the <clears throat> organization of government would um, go higher up, the bundles would become thicker and thicker. So a state and a nation and an empire would be the thickest bundle. And then these bundles would come together at certain points in history and they would form nodes. They were kind of like unusually large um, uh, connections between the different bundles. And at these nodes, I could see that there was an interesting um, property there that at that point, history was particularly malleable. So a person or a group of persons who understood the principles could really have a profound effect on history at those points, which otherwise might be very difficult. 
And this was 1995, and I saw that the next node on the timeline was 1998. The other remarkable thing about this timeline was that the when the bundle separated, part going to heaven, part going to hell, there was a big difference in the size. And I worked as a machinist, so I like to say I've got a calibrated eyeball. I can visually measure things probably to within one part in a thousand pretty consistently and accurately. And I can say within plus or minus a tenth of a percent that 2.5% went to heaven and the balance went to hell. And I should say this excludes uh, those that um, do not reach the age of majority or are never uh, mentally competent enough to understand the gospel. But the rest of the population, the general population, um, that's the numbers. And I've uh, <clears throat> talked to several other people who've had NDEs or other revelations from God who confirmed exactly the same uh, numbers. Anyway, uh, when I realized that, Christ interjected and he said, um, he was aware of that and he was very disappointed. He really considered that to be a major failure of the church because he explained to me that um, from the time of the apostles, the church had everything necessary to win the entire population of earth to Christ in any generation. And they had consistently failed to do better than two and a half percent. Anyway, we go back to the um, questions and we, we looked at uh, one person's life, which is basically an infinite number of possibilities. And it was done so easily. Um, it was very routine. And then we looked how two people would interact. And again, it was an infinity number of permutations multiplied by an infinite number of permutations. And it was effortless and made perfect sense. I saw how everything worked together. And then we would go on to watch how um, a family would interact. And then two families would interact. And then a community would interact. And then uh, a larger group, such as state, a nation, an empire, and the whole of history. And the exercise was done, to, which seemed subjectively to me, in about five minutes. Uh, again, time in heaven is not comparable to time on earth because it's eternal and um, earth is on a timeline. <coughs> Just a quick interjection about the difference is that in heaven, things go by cycles and levels rather than by uh, linear time, but that's a whole other topic. Then the um, at the end of that, uh, there was like a pause as if Christ were waiting for some kind of response, but I was just thrilled. I had, that was the experience of my life. Um, it was amazing. And I was just kind of bubbling with excitement and I was trying to absorb this whole experience. And I had absorbed an enormous amount of information, literally <clears throat> infinity times infinity times infinity uh, to the infinite power of information. And again, as an engineer, I really value information. And so I was really savoring this. And then while I was doing that, Christ said, Carl, let's look at this from another perspective. And so we repeated the exercise with a different perspective, different criteria. <clears throat> um, again, it was the same sort of experience, but it, it was altogether uh, different and interesting. And as we finished that uh, iteration, uh, there was a pause, like Christ was waiting for something, some kind of reaction from me, and he apparently didn't get it. <clears throat> so he said for third time, Carl, let's do this one more time. And I know enough from reading the scriptures, from other people's experiences um, in my own life, that God gives you three opportunities to really get something. And if you don't get it on the third try, uh, you've failed. And it's very important that by the third try, you get it right because there will not be another opportunity. And suddenly I sobered up, <clears throat> put my excitement away, and I said, oh, I missed something. i got to pay attention. It's very important that I pay attention because I have to get what it is that he wants me to really get out of this experience. This is not for my entertainment. There is a purpose behind this, and I'll let you know that everything God does is with purpose ad infinitum. <clears throat> So we went through the third exercise, and this time <clears throat> I paid very close attention to what he was showing me, and I watched carefully the person's lives, their decisions, 
the colors and the threads. <clears throat> and that's when I noticed a pattern that the threads were white when persons were making decisions based on a particular criteria, selfless love. And when they were making sins, when they were committing sins, trespasses, um, they were acting selfishly. Uh, <clears throat> there were three things that really uh, were messing up their lives. One was selfishness, one was cowardice, and the other was laziness. And um, Christ interjected then that, yeah, that's where the church really is let down here because it needs to be teaching the people to be selfless, to be diligent, and to be courageous. And as I realized that, I realized that selfless love is what it's really about. <clears throat> that the whole of creation, all of this is to teach us one fundamental lesson, and that is selfless love. And that's when I realized what the ultimate question was. If you want to answer what's important about your decision, what you're going to do, the question is, what does this have to do with selfless love? If you're acting in selfless love, you're doing well. If you're acting on any other motivation, and, and I told you earlier, my main motivation was duty and the fear of hell, uh, neither of which mattered uh, really to, to the Lord. <clears throat> I mean, duty is important. But it's really selfless love, not just love, uh, not as um, <clears throat> not as uh, C.S. Lewis wrote about, you know, eros or um, or uh, phylos, but it was agape uh, love, mm -hmm. selfless love, the one that Peter stumbled over. And Christ didn't even finish that third exercise. As soon as I got it, he said, "Carl, you understand what I'm trying to teach you. It's time for you to go back." And then. We began to separate uh, my mind from his, my spirit from his. And as that happened, my mind um, <clears throat> re returned to its normal capacities. And as it did, this enormous amount of information just started to rush out of me. And I was like, oh, this is important. This is valuable stuff. I want to retain this information. And, and in the spirit, I was just trying to grasp it, trying to hold it on, trying to pull it back in because I wanted to keep that. It was very powerful stuff, um, but Christ said, you have what you need, that's not for you to keep. And so we separated and I found myself back in the living room and I was uh, standing with Christ by my body. <clears throat> and uh, he didn't say anything more to me, but I just felt this kind of a pulling towards my body and I knew that my body was now viable. It was time to come back, and it was just like I was sucked right into my body. The first thing I noticed was the pain. It wasn't anywhere near as bad as before, but I have scoliosis, and so I have constant back pain, and I still had some pain in my hand, um, and it was dark. When I opened my eyes, uh, it was pitch black, so I knew I was back in my body, and I couldn't see in the dark anymore. <clears throat> And uh, so I got up off the couch cushions. I was very glad to be alive. And I headed straight to the bathroom because I wanted to see what had happened. Now I got to the bathroom. I flipped on the switch, looked in the mirror, and the, all the red was gone from my face. The hair was still crinkly and my eyebrows were still gone. But the burns on my arm and hand were almost completely gone. I have one little spot right here uh, that's still just a little bit discolored. And everything else was pretty well healed. My, I rinsed the pus out of my eyes and I could see plainly. Uh, I could swallow, no pain in my throat. And the first thing I thought about was, I'm so thirsty. I'm hungry. I haven't eaten or drunk hardly anything in three days. And so um, I went straight to the kitchen. I flipped on the light and the first thing I did was I wanted to see how long I'd been dead. So I looked up at the clock in the living room or kitchen wall. And it was six minutes after midnight. So deducting a minute for the bathroom trip, I was gone about five minutes. And I was kind of surprised that all that experience happened in five minutes or less. Um, and then I was hungry, so I started making breakfast. It's my favorite meal, and even though it's midnight, I cooked up a nice breakfast and I sat down at the table and I was eating. And then the mother of my children, um, came in the doorway and she looked at me and said, Carl, what are you doing? It's 
midnight and you're making so much noise. And I said, Yanina, I had the most incredible experience. I died and, and I met Christ and he healed me and I'm back and I'm so hungry, I'm eating breakfast. And she looked at me for a moment like I was crazy. And then she said, well, stop making so much noise. And then she went back to bed. <laughs> she, didn't, she didn't have a whole lot of empathy for you at that point. Uh, that's a astute observation, yes. <laughs> and uh, if I may, there were a few things that um, kind of followed up that experience that I'd like to share. Please. So, um, as I mentioned, Christ showed me how to use the gift of healing. Now, I had never uh, experienced healing before when I prayed for people. But after that experience, and especially for the next 18 months, um, God could heal anyone of anything immediately and permanently through that gift. Uh, the issue was that the church I attended at the time did not believe in supernatural healing or supernatural anything. <clears throat> and they, the pastor actually forbid me to minister healing to the congregation. So I had to try to find opportunities for it. And unfortunately, the gift atrophies when it's not used. And so uh, over the next 18 months, the, the gift declined substantially in its effectiveness. It still operates today. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm really looking for opportunities to minister healing to people because that not only helps them, it helps me maintain the gift. Uh, the other thing that was interesting was that, again, for about the same time period, 18 months, uh, whenever I got into the presence of another person who had had a near-death experience, I knew it. I can explain how I knew it. It was just, I knew it. And so I would ask them, you know, tell me about your experience. And as I learned, as you probably knew, um, and as they experienced, if you haven't had a near-death experience, uh, it's very difficult for you to relate to it. And we had all had very hostile reactions to giving a testimony about that experience. And so they were initially quite reluctant to share their stories. But when I would tell them about my experience, then they would open up and I got some great stories. I think one of the most remarkable ones was a woman who died twice. The first time she went to hell, she got her life right, and then she came back. And this time she went to heaven and she met her family that had predeceased her. And they told her it was time to come back. So <clears throat> obviously she was back. I got some great stories. But the thing about them was, <clears throat> you know, we see a lot of near-death experiences. Uh, they're all over the map as far as uh, the content and the uh, even the spiritual or religious implications. Every one of these was absolutely, even though they were all different, all individual, they were all absolutely consistent with the revelation in the scriptures. So that was something I think was remarkable and worth sharing about that. Mm -hmm. I concur. I concur. The ones that, <clears throat> uh, with whom I've interviewed now in the, in the hundreds, uh, not thousands now, because not all have been on our program, uh, are very consistent with, um, with scripture. And that's the thing I think Christians need to understand that, uh, these, and near-death experience accounts those are that are christ-centered as with uh with our friend carl uh that they're very consistent paul the third heaven stephen uh a number of others jesus himself told the uh story of the rich man and, and <clears throat> lazarus the former uh, beggar who was in heaven and the rich man being in hell so the uh what what strikes me carl about your um, story is that you are obviously an intelligent man. You are an engineer by training. And also you have a very analytical way of thinking and that Jesus approached you, approached you in a very analytical type of way, uh, answers to questions. And the only way to really assimilate those in any form of comprehension would be to basically, uh, there's a Star Trek term, which was the uh, mind melt. And as I mentioned at the, at the onset of this interview, episode, yes. it was the, uh, 
that Christ, uh, I mean, <clears throat> Paul, excuse me, talked about the Christ mindset that is imparted, that is seeing through the eyes of Jesus. And you had that in a way that revealed in a very unique aspect in the presentation of the colors and the threads and, and the means that could only be uh, assimilated through a comprehension that has virtually no parallel in, in the scientific world that I'm aware of. Um, but one that one could understand perhaps by piecing together how God fashioned humankind. He used DNA threads. Uh, we've all seen the cord, the intertwined cord <clears throat> and how God fashioned DNA and RNA and the chromosomes and, and so forth. Um, and I find it very interesting that, that kind of when you were looking through the mind of Christ, that you were seeing these things in a way that, that um, we've not yet discovered or understood and will more than likely never until uh, we reach heaven. So uh, my question to you, Carl, will give you an opportunity to exercise that <clears throat> gift that you have of healing. Um, it was uh, Paul, actually, who was mentoring Timothy, and Timothy was essentially instructed by Paul to exercise that gift to your point uh, so that it would remain active. So we're going to give you an, an opportunity to pray for uh, thousands upon thousands of people right now who are suffering in some way, shape, or form. So you'll get lot, lots of uh, spiritual... Um, uh, muscularization, if you will, <laughs> that you'll, you'll be able to exercise that uh, exponentially here in a moment. First of all, I want to ask you, where can we get all of your book? Okay, well, um, my motive for writing the book is to get uh, my story out, tell the truth. So they can contact me through my Facebook page. It's under Carl Falcon, K-A-R-L-F-A-L-K-E-N. And through Facebook Messenger, I can send them a free copy by PDF. So that's the simplest and easy way to get it. It's also available on eBay under the title, The Ultimate Question, How Will You Answer It? Um, and again, if someone contacts me, <clears throat> I will be glad to send them a copy as far as the you know funds available or allow it. I don't want to make a profit off of this. So I sell it at my cost and if that's it's and so if that's you'll know, you'll know, if you compare it with other books the, the cost is minimal but if somebody can't afford even that i'll do my best to send them a free copy uh, within you know my own limitations very good well we will put the link to that uh, in the body of this message and um you know, I appreciate, Carl, that, uh, that you have brought an impartation in terms of both understanding and an articulation of what, uh, what you experienced and, and now gracious offering uh, and the answers to those questions that, that you had uh, or that, that Jesus posed as a question in an answer to you that you are have, uh, have authored now, currently. So um, on our program, I give the opportunity for our guests to pray for our audience, and I'm going to invite you to do that. And uh, since you have a gift of uh, healing, would you be kind <clears throat> enough to, uh, to pray for our audience now? I would do that with pleasure. <clears throat> Thank me. you. <clears throat> So, Randy, I would do that with pleasure. Thank you. But I want to um, preface that with uh, three important points about ministering healing. I told you that uh, my early introduction to healing ministry was through the books and writings of John G. Lake. And um, his successor, Curry Blake, has had a profound um, effect on me through his teachings. And I want to just share three very critical points um, to what does and does not 
allow for healing to work. Uh, the first thing is that um, if you look in the scriptures, neither Christ nor the apostles ever asked God to heal anyone. The simple fact is they heal people. <clears throat> if they said or did anything, they would say they would declare that the person was healed. Um, and then the other thing they would do is to lay hands on them. The Apostle Paul, um, in his writings, also added the practice of um, having the elders lay hands on and anoint people with oil. Obviously, that may be helpful, but it's not necessary. So um, I don't pray for God to heal people. I declare them healed, and I release the power of God to do that. Uh, then there are two things which interfere with healing by ministry. Uh, the first thing is unbelief. <clears throat> if you don't believe uh, that you can be healed supernaturally by the power of God, uh, I can't do anything for you. Um, and there are people who believe in it and don't receive it. Uh, a typical example of that is somebody, say, on disability, and they're like, well, if I get healed, I'll have to go back to work. So first of all, you have to believe that God heals supernaturally. And two, you have to receive it. I can release the power. Um, but I've prayed for people on their deathbeds, and I felt the power of God come through me and go to them and then come back. I asked them what was wrong. They said, I don't want to go through this again. They wanted to die. They said, I want to be with Jesus. Um, and it's like, you can be with Jesus here and now. You don't have to go to heaven to do that, but they refused it. So <clears throat> you have to receive the healing. You have to believe it's in healing. The third thing that interferes with uh, healing by ministry is what I call the traditions of men and the doctrines of demons. If you believe that God um, has, you have to do something to receive healing, for example, you have to merit the healing, that's heresy and that will interfere with it. <clears throat> okay, um, You've done nothing to earn this. It's a free gift of God. So you don't have to merit it. You don't have to do anything to receive it. It's for you. And then um, there's a whole another subject, the doctrines of demons. Um, if you've believed in something like in typical cults, uh, that they've taught you wrong about healing, that can interfere with it too. So put aside uh, man's traditions, put aside doctrines of demons. And the simple fact is Christ paid for your healing. Isaiah said we are healed by his wounds. Paul, Peter wrote that we were healed by his wounds. It's a done deal. It's a promise of God. You don't have to do anything to receive it. You don't have to pay anything for it. You don't even have to be a Christian. <clears throat> it's for everybody, everywhere. And I'm feeling the power of God coming on me now, so I think we're ready to pray. Please. Yes. That was a good point. Those are good points. Yes. Excellent. So, and one thing I will just add here is that I don't heal anybody. It's the Holy Spirit that heals. Yes. By the power of God, through the grace that we have through Christ's finished work, um, in his passion, especially in the, uh, when he was beaten and scourged in the court of Pontius Pilate. So that's how it works. And I would ask you, um, if, since we can't lay hands on you, just put your hand on the screen. This has worked many times. And I just declare all your infirmities healed by the finished work of Jesus Christ. And I bind any spirit of infirmity by Matthew 18, 18 through 20, by the word of God. This is the promise of God. I release the power of God. I release the angels of God. I release the Holy Spirit with fire to heal you of whatever you need. And I declare that you will maintain your healing and it's for the glory of God. Amen. Very simple, very effective, and very powerful. So, Carl, it's going to been a great pleasure. Thank you for both sharing your story and the instruction that comes with it. And uh, 
thank you again for, for being transparent uh, and for expressing something that is truly miraculous and supernatural and of Christ. So thank you. Thank you, Randy. It was a great privilege and a pleasure. I look forward from <clears throat> I look forward to hearing from you again. Likewise, look forward to uh, staying in touch with you. And now we have some uh, great news for those of you who are watching this. And that is if you are indeed in Christ Jesus, having accepted what he did for you on the cross by asking his forgiveness to become Lord of your life as Lord and Savior, be of good cheer because heaven is in your future. Take care and God bless. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe. And if you'd like further information, go to our website at randyk.org, where our mission is simple, to share the great news of God's love.